1 Samuel 15. Verse 22. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. A very familiar verse. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And this was part of my chronological sequence in last week that Goliath is going to come with his army after this. Saul already knows that he has been rejected as king and someone else will become king. I would like to say that this played on Saul's mind. I'm sure it did because if the Lord has anointed you, I'm not trying to be overly sympathetic here, but we know that he had mental issues. Who did? Saul. Okay. The scripture says that the Lord sent an evil spirit to torment him. But let us say in the 21st century, we understand mental illness a little bit differently. And I want to say that he did have these issues, and probably for a long time. He was not ambitious. He was like, okay, no, I don't want to be king. I'm a nobody. I'm from the smallest tribe. I'm unimportant. Why me? Would you say a reluctant king? A king in spite of himself? He didn't want the job. He didn't apply for the job, but he got the job. And then he got rejected from the job. I almost want to say politicians, some politicians are like that. They don't really want to run. They get selected and forced and encouraged to run. And then once you're out there, it's like, okay, open season on you. But I didn't really want to be a politician anyway. And now all this ugliness of whatever the right noun is, is in my face and in my life and I'm exposed and things that I don't want people to know about myself are now public. I guess you have to have a strong will to say no when they say, uh, would you run for this particular seat or this position? Yeah. No, I'm not interested. Sometimes, you know, you allow yourself to be talked into things that you're not 100% on board with, and then your life gets overexposed. There's some people who are ambitious, very ambitious, and would lie through every part of their face about their education. Okay, sorry. But there's some people who don't want it, and they have it thrust upon them. Some are born great, some achieve greatness, others have greatness thrust upon them. So again, that's the, the little bit of the back story behind Saul. But, but Saul was not ultimately rejected because he was, uh, diso well, I guess he was disobedient. That's what it says. He did, he, he, in a sense, he did have a choice in the matter. He could have chosen to obey. Right. right. But he chose not to. Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as in obeying his voice. So again, this happens before the David and Goliath incident. And last week we said that David also was already in his employ as the harpist, who would soothe him when he had his mental... From when he was a young boy. Who, David? Yeah. Well, we're not exactly sure how young. Let's say a teenager, but that's not... We're not sure. I think he's 17 when he faces Okay. Life. Yeah, I think his birthday was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but he was anointed, I think, when he was eight. So years went by. Look at chapter 18. What's the title on chapter 18 in your Bible? Saul's Growing Fear of David. Saul's Growing Fear of David. Anybody else? David is a fugitive, sorry. Saul becomes jealous. Saul is jealous. Saul resents David. Meanwhile, back at the ranch... Saul's son Jonathan. has become fond of David. They become like best buds. Scripture says in chapter 18, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Mm -hmm. Jonathan and David made a covenant, verse 3, because he loved him as his own soul and Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely and Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So there's relationship now. Mm -hmm. But something happened when he came home after he killed Goliath. Lots of stuff happened. <laughs> now what Saul had said was whoever kills Goliath can have my daughter mm -hmm. in marriage. And his family will be tax exempt for the rest of their lives. And a few other goodies was added on there. What were you going to say? Why would you want to marry his daughter? <laughs> he was a madman and he was trying to get you. But the, uh, the younger sister <laughs> was in love with David and David married her. Okay, Jonathan was a good person. 
And Jonathan was a good yeah. guy. Mm-hmm. You have a good brother-in-law. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's a lot, a lot of details that said we're going to move a little faster. Yeah. In chapter 19, any titles there? What titles do you have? Saul tries to kill David. Mm-hmm. Saul tries to kill David. So you just made him like the captain of the army. And a few verses later, he is like, I'm so envious and jealous, and I, it happens. He is persecuting David. Chapter 20, what titles do you have there? David's faithful friend, Jonathan. Reaffirming covenant loyalty. Covenant loyalty. Friend David and Jonathan is all my life. David and Jonathan. Jonathan. We need a verb. <laughs> Jonathan helps David. Jonathan is helping David. So they're continuing this covenant. Uh, his father is coming after David, and Jonathan is saying, okay, I'm going to help you to avoid the attack from my father. Jonathan has accepted that David is going to be the next king. Saul is saying, you are loyal to him. He's going to be disloyal to you. He's going to take what should be yours, the right to be king. But Jonathan has already said, I'm okay with that. Yes? It's almost like instead of the story of Saul is over. God has rejected him. That everything that falls with David after is to mature David and grow him and for God to see where his loyalty is, like in the cave. Well, there are many interpretations of it. That's one interpretation. And other people, reasonable people, can differ sometimes on how to interpret these things. So different scholars have different ways of interpreting it. I'm not a Bible scholar, so I'm going to just leave it right there. That's a possible interpretation. What do you see in chapter 21? David at Nob. David at Nob. Strengthen, strengthen one another. Yeah. So this is David with his men, and they're hungry. And he goes to the priest at Nob and says, uh, you have any bread? And the priest said, well, we have yesterday's show bread from the mm-hmm. table. So David and his men get some stale bread. Well, not stale, but day-old bread. <laughs> chapter 22. What do you see there? David has 400 men. David has 400 men. All right, if there are no more details, let's go to chapter 23. We're almost at our landing spot for today. Mm-hmm. Chapter 23, what do you see there? Zip, Z I P H. Okay, anything else? David saves the city of um... Keilah. So I give you a map. And if you want to locate Keilah, Rama and Gibeah are in the area that was assigned to Benjamin, the smallest tribe, where Saul is from. Ramah is where Samuel is from. So Benjamin is just north of Judah. Judah has this very large area with Simeon somewhere in the middle. And Jerusalem is actually kind of in the land of Benjamin. It was called Jebus. The Jebusites were the people there. So I would say that the land of Benjamin is right there, and south of that is Judah. You see the main road coming down from Ramah to Jerusalem? Yes. To Hebron, and further south of that, you'll see a few places we locate today. Head west on the road from Hebron, okay? Yep. And then go north off the road, and you'll see Keilah. Yeah. So that is in Judah. The Philistines, we said last week, were Cretans, who were warring kind of people, who tried to go and attack Egypt, and the Egyptians pushed them back, and they landed on the western coast, and they attacked the people in those cities, and they took over five of the cities there. So that's where the Philistines are. So the Philistines are, as I said, Cretans. Crete is part of the Greek Empire. So they're Europeans, and they're coming into this place with Middle Easterners, trying to take over. So they're in the Philistia area, and they're always trying to claim more territory in Judah. That's their MO right now. In chapter 23, they're attacking Keilah. So they have their main cities, but they're going after Keilah. They've attacked so many times. I said last week that the word Philistines appears 200 plus times in the Old Testament. So there's a lot of attacking. Back and forth, winning and losing. So they're attacking Keilah. Keilah is a walled city. The thing with walled cities is that you, put, you build a wall to protect. Robert Frost said that sometimes you build a wall to keep others out. Or to keep yourself in. Anyway, it's a walled city. And if you think about walled cities, you can besiege a walled city. Starve them out. The Philistines are attacking, and David asks of the Lord. So let's play with a couple of verses there. Chapter 23, verse 1. They told David, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah. So apparently it was a grain harvest. The farmers had their grain, and they were threshing, and the Philistines are attacking. Okay, we're going to steal your grain. 
because we need, that's what we do, we plunder other cities for their stuff. So the farmers are not happy. David was told that the Philistines were fighting against Keilah and robbing the threshing floors. In verse 2 is interesting, it says, David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said to David, go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. David asked the Lord, should I do this? The Lord says, yes. Verse 3 says, but David's men said, here we are, afraid of Saul and all his people. And we're going to go attack these other people and get ourselves now involved with the Philistines? Uh, are you sure the Lord said that? David, in verse 4, David inquired of the Lord again. Like, Lord, my men aren't sure that I heard you right the first time. So can you repeat that? And the Lord answered him again, Arise and go down to Keilah. I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. So it's affirmed. I will deliver them. The first time the Lord said, yes, go and defend Keilah. And now he's saying, not only go defend them, but I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Verse 7 of chapter 23. Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. And Saul said, aha, God has delivered him into my hand. God has delivered him. He's going to rescue Keilah. It's a wall city, and I'm going to besiege the city. I'm going to lock him into the city, and I'm going to get the man. Because remember, all this time, he's like out to get David. He'd thrown a spear at him once before, and well, twice before, and he just wants David gone because he views David as a threat. And David is going to this wall city to defend the city against the Philistines. And Saul, I don't know how many miles far away, hears that David is doing this. Hey guys, we're going to get David. I think he is a little loco. <laughs> because there are other things you could be doing. You hear that he is going to rescue these people, and you're not thinking, yeah, he's doing a good thing. You're thinking, I still want to get him. I don't care why he is going there, I want to get him. Verse 9, <clears throat> David knew that Saul plotted evil against him. And he said to the priests, bring the ephod. Then David said, O oh Lord, your servant has heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Please tell your servant. And the Lord said, yes, Saul is coming down. And David asked the Lord, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, yes. <laughs> they will deliver you into the hand of Saul. Oh man! I thought I was doing a good thing here. And these guys are going to betray me to Saul. He's going to learn to stop asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the backstory. We're going to go to chapter 24 if there's any time left. <laughs> I'm hoping the map will be helpful to give us a sense as to where we are. You kind of know, like I said, Saul is coming down to get him. Once David finds out that Saul is coming, David has to make a decision. Hopefully, he has rescued the land of Keilah, the city of Keilah and push the Philistines back. And now he has to figure, what do I do? I can't afford to be caught in this walled city when Saul arrives because he will besiege the city. And the men of the city will give me up because they want their city to be rescued. Oh, you came for David? Here he is. Hand him over. Do us no harm. So David hightails out of there with his men. I think you can understand that, even if it's treason, you're going to say, well, you know, Saul wants him and Saul will not care who he kills when he comes. So I'm going to save my skin. David, perhaps it's time for you to leave. Thankfully, David left. So that Saul did not actually come down to Keilah as a result. Verse 13. David and 600 men arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could. Then it was told to Saul that David had escaped from Keilah and Saul halted the expedition. So David is now a wanted man, but he was a wanted man for a long time, but now he's running from place to place in the wilderness. The reason I slipped this map from the internet was because I wanted to point out En Gedi. That's where David is going to be. But before he goes there, he's going to go in other places, trying to escape. But he has all these men with him. It's just rocks and dirts on mountains. There's no vegetation almost. And you see the mountain goats and you're thinking, what are they eating? The pictures I saw, I saw a video of the mountain goats climbing the trees to get a little leaf here and a little leaf there. Wow, there's nothing else. There's no vegetation. It's like, how can anything live here? Anyway, apparently the mountain goats have worked it out. <laughs> so why are you going to take your 600 men to this wilderness desert area? But I want to point out that right here is Bethlehem. So we are or southeast of Bethlehem. And guess who knows this area like the back of their hand? 
David, that's where he grew up, with his sheep. So all of this area, he already knows what the terrain is like. So when he decides that's where he's going to go, he's going to tell his men, you know what, that's my hometown. That's my, that's my area. I know the area there. I know where there's not stuff. And one of the things that was there was a waterfall, a spring, an oasis. And that's where he was going, close to that oasis. Because you don't want to go into a desert area with nothing, without a plan. He says, I know there's an oasis there. We're going to go there and hide from Saul. So that's the back story. Hopefully, we're all on the same page now. So there are different towns on the map. You'll see on my arrow, just under the arrow, you'll see what looks like a Z-I-P-H as you come down the road from Hebron. Ziph, he's in that area. Horesh, he's in that area. And those are some of the places, the wilderness of Ziph, and that's where he's at. Southeast of where he grew up in lands that I'm claiming, without knowing, that he was familiar with. He certainly had an idea of what the terrain was like. But when you tell your men, we're going next to the Dead Sea, why? The Dead Sea? <laughs> kind of like nothing there. But he kind of knows where the caves are and where to hide. All right, chapter 24. I'm going to read from the handout. Life before kingship was simple for Saul. Though he may have looked kingly, tall, handsome, and a valiant soldier, he was not seeking fame or glory. As a warrior, he was praised by the people for his exploits. But he appears to have had significant issues. And his downfall was because of his self-will. What kind of disobedience did you call it? Partial? Incomplete. Incomplete. Incomplete When the prophet Samuel confronted Saul and told him, You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. In 1526, Saul acknowledged that he had sinned. But he begged Samuel, Honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me. Saul's concern was with what people would think if Samuel did not make an appearance with him after his great victory over the Amalekites. However, he should have been distraught over the fact that the Lord had rejected him. Once David came to prominence, Saul's attempts to take David's life put David on the run as a fugitive. In today's scripture focus, we find Saul hunting David with the help of 3,000 fighting men. We also learn how David dealt with Saul, who considered David as his enemy. So the passage heading here is David spares Saul as Saul is hunting him. We're going to read verses 1 through 22, the entire chapter of 1 Samuel 24 after a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, sometimes we find ourselves in difficult situations with people out to get us. Sometimes, Lord, we do have enemies. But you've called us to love our enemies as difficult as that might be. And our obedience to your will for our lives is of utmost importance, dear God. We pray that we will be able to reach that stage where we understand that when you say something that you want us to do, that we will do it wholeheartedly and to the best of our ability. May this lesson help to reinforce that in our hearts. And may we grow from strength to strength, trusting you in difficult situations of our lives. May this lesson be a blessing to us, and may we leave saying we were glad we came to participate in this study today, for Christ's sake. Amen. If you flip to 1 Samuel 26, two chapters on, you have a, sub, a subheading there. David spares Saul again. David spares Saul again. So even though Saul seems as though he is repentant, or at least acknowledging that David did a good thing, his mental anguish is still there, and he's still going to come after David. David had a chance to, uh, to out so, let me yeah. so he was still the king. David had David said, "No, he didn't do that to the king." Mm -hmm. I will not touch yeah. the Lord's anointed. Anointed. And let's see how many questions we can work through here. I had chosen a song that I thought might go well with the session. Samuel Barnard is the author. Jehovah is our strength, and he shall be our song. We shall overcome at length, although our foes be strong. In vain does Satan then oppose. The key word there is in vain. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For God is stronger than his foes. Verse 3 of that song says, The Lord our refuge is. And as I looked at these two verses last night, I kept thinking, okay, one says refuge, the other says strength. That sounds like Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. The Lord our refuge is and ever will remain. Since he has made us his, he will our cause maintain. In vain our enemies oppose, for God is stronger than his foes. I said in vain. 
But I guess the more important phrase is the last one. God is stronger than his foes. So David knows this. He's being anointed. He's being selected. He's asking the Lord several times the same question. Should I do this? Are you sure you should do this? And the Lord is answering him. And Saul is asking the Lord, and he said, the Lord is even responding to Saul. So Saul knows he's being rejected, and it's driving him bananas. Question number one said to review, which is what we just did, and I reviewed from 15 through 24. We kind of know why Saul is pursuing David. Question number two, what had Saul been doing, and what did he intend to do? Pursuing, chasing, chasing David. What was in his intent? To eliminate David. Question number three. Look at verse three. Where does David finally encounter Saul? David. <laughs> David and the are at rest in the cave. 601 men in this cave. <laughs> Somebody has jokes. In the man cave. man cave. Question number four. What did David's men think? was the reason for the encounter in, question, in verse 4. What did David's men think was the reason for this encounter? The Lord has given your enemy into your hand. Okay. This is, the Lord's doing. This is what he's, they've been waiting for. Waiting see, how the Lord, see how the Lord works? He delivers it into your hand. Yeah. We are here. Yeah. Okay. Of all the caves in the world to go and relieve yourself, he comes right where we are. <laughs> Look, this is from the Lord. It must be. It has to be the Lord's doing. It has to be the Lord's doing. Question number five. What did David do in verse four? Crept forward and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. I wanted to visualize what that was like. I think his robe was really long. I watched a video <laughs> and he took off his robe and he set it down. Okay. Oh, before he did. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the cameraman? <laughs> there, was, there was some modesty there. <laughs> yeah. So David saw the robe and he went and cut off a piece of the robe. Yeah. Okay. You know, David exercised, I think, based on his relationship with the Lord, a great deal of restraint because under normal circumstances with the average person, that would have been interpreted even in our own lives. You're right. This is it. This must be it. And so the Lord must have done it. And so I really think that there's a real application in that one for all of us. Mm -hmm. Because just because it looks like it's the Lord, we have to be willing to go back and say, Lord, is this you? Or don't jump on the thing mm -hmm. immediately. I mean, there's just so much restraint and temptation to do what even looks like the Lord is telling you to do. That, that's something we all have to learn. It helps to know that David would ask the same question multiple times in the past. Mm -hmm. right. Lord, can you confirm that this is your will because I do not want to go outside of your will. Yeah, right. Are we saying it's not, wasn't his will to kill him at that point? No, it wasn't. Touch not the Lord's anointed, what are you saying? Yeah. I will not kill the right. king. Because that's not any different than what Saul did when they said kill everybody in the Oh, no, no, no. So the difference. He did it. No, the difference so is that. So I just want to get that straight. Let me clarify that. Anointing. No, no, no. Okay. The difference is that the man of God, Samuel, was speaking on behalf of God and told him, "Kill everything." In this one, David's people, like the randoms, are saying, "This is the Lord. Act on it." And there's a huge difference between when you get it directly from the Lord. Or in this case, in this setting, the prophet. There's also the chain of command too. Yeah. Um, you know that 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 idea is coming from a, a, a level of been, uh, under David's command. I'm just really uh, distracted by uh, you know Paul's exhortation to the Romans that every person be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those who exist have been instituted by God. I, and then I take it back to Christ himself, you know, at the, with, with Pilate, Pilate 
and uh, you know, there's no authority given to you except that was given to you by my father. Which in my mind, and, and, and this is, I, I you know you don't want to go off on this tangent, but this is the exact opposite approach to authority that we have in, in the present age. You know, whether it be in our churches, our schools, our, uh, our, our uh, civil servants, our police enforcement, this is the exact opposite approach that we have to authority in the modern age. The men knew that the Lord had told David, you know, don't, uh, don't strike me like that, that he was going to be delivered into his hands. Because it's the men in the cave who say, right. this is the day the Lord spoke of. Right. So the men knew something was about to happen or could be about to happen or could not happen. What's the Lord testing David to see if he would show? Because he left it up to David. Mm -hmm. and he was he up going to, to show mercy and grace or was he going to seek revenge? Or is he shown because the heart of God is yeah. mercy and grace. Scripture says David was a man after God's own heart. But it was a test for David. Are you going to seek revenge? Because I'm going to give you your enemy. And you can do as you choose. And we run into, and you're right, we've run into that many times. What we desire most or seek revenge or whatever stands in front of us or is close to us and we have a choice to make. Are we going to behave like Yeshua or are we going to behave like human beings do the flesh? I would have focused more on the obedience, what we're gonna say. Well that's what I'm talking obedience. about. I just think there's a third third uh, aspect to that between mercy and grace shown by him or um, whatever the other one was is the idea that he's just gonna respect the office. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I say bigger than that. It's like it here's be. what the Lord wants. Yeah. yeah, he already had the word from the Lord that the enemy was going to be delivered into his hand. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Sometimes we have to ask again mm -hmm. because it's so easy to say the enemy has been delivered into my hand. The question is, what do you do? Is this the right moment? So. And if we're not walking really close to the Lord, it's easy to listen to people around us. Yeah. You know, that's my or listen to the voice in our head. Right. That tells us, you know, you need to seek revenge. You need to fix things. You pray for God to do it, but you say, Lord, justify what I'm doing. This or this honor. honor. Honor what I'm doing. I'm going to do it and ask you to bless what I'm doing after I've done it. Yeah. Or so. I don't have to take action. Mm -hmm. uh, unless we go over, we're not going to get done. Okay. Question number six. How do David's words impact the men? Verse seven. He persuaded them not to fight. They followed David's lead. He did not allow them to attack Saul. Yeah. He rebuked them, it says. He sharply rebuked his men. And he would not allow them to attack Saul. Question number eight. I'm skipping number seven. I'll just ask it, but not wait for an answer. Have you ever felt an inkling to exact revenge on someone who you viewed as an enemy? Question number eight. Why did David bow down to Saul? Verse eight. I think that's interesting because he puts himself, knowing this person wants to kill him, he puts himself in an extremely vulnerable position. Right. So he is not able to, you know, it says he prostrate right to the ground. So all Saul has to do is pull his sword out, chop his right. head off. So he puts himself, you know, literally, he humbles himself down to the point where he can't even defend him own, his own self anymore. Mm -hmm. Saul was still the king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it, God anointed him. Yeah. And I'm David, and I am not touching the anointed one. I'm intrigued with the length of the response by a prostrate yeah. man down on the ground. It's an right. extremely yeah. verbose response. Yeah. Yeah. Like, okay, while you're talking, the man can pull the sword and kill you. Yeah. So you're working on, okay, you need to listen to what I'm saying. Your conscience needs to let you know that what you are in is bigger than you. I'm not going to do anything to you, but why do you keep 
doing this to me. Right. Saul doesn't stop. He stops for a moment. But it must be like he's working on him. Like, okay, hey, buddy. Of course, David has the 600 men probably backing them up right there. And Saul's men are probably at a distance because they respected the fact that he wanted to go relieve himself. Yeah. And maybe David has the advantage. That's what we could talk about. David having the advantage over Goliath because he was fleet-footed and skilled. Maybe David knew he had the advantage here. But even if he did not think he had an advantage, he was trying to be obedient to the voice of God. Yes? It says in my commentary that the Lord's anointed does not imply that Saul was still enjoying the Lord's anointing. Rather, it shows that David had an unfailing reverence for the anointing, anointed king, and mine has kind of like in the parenthetical king, of the Lord. And remember we were going through and um, reading the titles? Back in 1 Samuel 16, mm -hmm. it said David anointed king. And then when we were looking at what Jonathan did, my um, commentary was saying that in, verse, in chapter 18, in giving David his royal robe, his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt, Jonathan was giving his authority of succession to his father's throne to David. Now Saul goes into his long tirade as, as a response. You are more righteous than I. But in verse 16, it says he wept aloud. What do you get out of that? He starts bawling like a baby. Is it because of his mental issues? Or David convicted him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he wept silently, I could understand. But he's weeping loudly. <laughs> he's not convinced he doesn't want to kill David yet. Of course, we don't know that because that comes up later. Mm -hmm. This is just like some uh, crocodile, preliminary crocodile tears. I think his mental issues are getting the better of him here. Like, okay, he's agonized. Oh, he's in agony. Okay, I know I'm wrong. He's all mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. How it all played out. He's just, yeah. mentally, he's just messed up. All right. I said I, I'm asking for a couple of minutes to get a little further. I have two more questions. What does Saul acknowledge about David in verse 20? <clears throat> that David's going to be king. Mm -hmm. yeah. surely be king. Surely be and how do they part ways? Don't they make an oath? One more time, please. Don't they make an oath? Verse 22. 22. Yeah. Yeah. 21 and 20. Swear so, to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me, and that you will not destroy my name from my father's household. Yeah. So David... David swore to him and Saul returned home so what should David have taken at that point as okay where are we now he should be thinking we're good but they're not no he's <laughs> saying okay I'm going to remain in the stronghold I'm not sure I can trust you but I'm going to accept that you said you're going to back off you go home now and let me know that Saul is going to come back and seek to get him again Thank you, dear God, for the lesson of obedience, the lesson of listening to your voice and confirming what you want us to do. More important, dear God, that you call us to be loving when our nature is to show something other than loving, a loving nature to others. May this work on our hearts to make our hearts pliable to your will, always seeking you first. Because your word tells us, seek first the kingdom and your righteousness. May this lesson be a blessing to us. And may it instruct us in how to teach others as well to live their lives obedient to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.